my and my character is actually a wizard as well. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's all, it's all for a good cause. Uh, the first question I want to ask you is a technical one here, Matt, and it's about fracking. You know, you see it on on PBS all the time, discussed as a serious issue, but it doesn't get a lot of mainstream discussion. And you've made a whole movie where it's the theme. How much of this is a real threat to the well-being of the promised land, and how much of it is just the possibility of something going wrong in a big way? Well, that depends on who you talk to. Um, you know, there's a big, people are very divided about this. Um, there are, obviously, the ener energy industry has one uh, point of view about it, and then there are uh, people on the environmental side about uh, the opposite point of view. And then there are a lot of people in the middle trying to figure out, uh, you know, what the deal really is. And, uh, and then there are people who have a vested interest in, you know, for instance, a lot of these um, communities that are, are struggling with this are, are uh, you know, I mean, if you think a recession's bad in the city, you should see the way it hits the country. It's, these people are really struggling. And so, so these, these leases are a lifeline to them. A lot of times they're saving their family farms. Um, you know, they've been their families for generations, sometimes 100, 150 years. And then there are people on the other side of the argument who say, look, when, you know, when times get tough, do you bring your daughters to the whorehouse? Um, so, so there's a there's a real argument, um, you, you know, that's that's happening right now uh, about this. And 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 look, in in you know, there's in 20 years, we're going to be very clear about what the uh, environmental ramifications of this are. I mean, the, you know, on the, but but right now, there's still people. You know, this is this is all this is relatively new. This um, the type of fracking that they're doing now is relatively new um, but there are documented cases people have there's a list of a few hundred people who have publicly said uh, uh, that they they have become sick because of this um, you know a lot of people are locked up in non-disclosure agreements because these leases uh, usually you know as we talk about in the movie have some fine print about that so it's a big it's a big uh, argument and you know and, and people feel very strongly and the stakes are incredibly high which is why it was a good it was a good background uh, issue to, to tell a story about American identity and where we are now as a country. Uh, how well do you know the science of this? Because I know nothing about it, but here's what I, where I'm confused. We keep hearing from everybody that there is this unlimited supply of natural gas under our feet in the United States. It could fuel America for the next uh, uh, few decades. Why are we even pandering after all this Mideast oil, blah, 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 blah. Right. But it seems to me that fracking is a science that goes after more surface natural gas in the same way, I guess, the analogy might be strip mining for coal. In other words, this is stuff near the surface. It's, it's, it's causing potential environmental damage. My question is, and you may not know the answer to this, it may be a scientist, scientist question, why don't they just go after the less dangerous, the stuff that's deeper down? Why don't they no, just... That's the stuff they're going after. They're going way, way, way down to get okay. this stuff. Um, but the issues are... There are a few of them. They're about the well casings and are they failing? And the, the energy industry says they fail at about a 6% rate. Okay, and then after 30 years, they fail at about a 50% rate. So that's a, that's a problem. Then, then you have the, the methane capture, right? Some of it leaks when it comes up. And methane, very, very bad for the environment, for is a greenhouse gas. It's like 50 times worse than. So you get, so there are huge climate change, climate change uh, implications there. Uh, and so, so, so the question, you know, th there's a huge gamut the way these, these, uh, a lot of these companies operate, you know, some of them, you know, if you look at, you know, the BP versus, you know, some of these other companies, like some of them, there's, there, there are companies that are cowboys who are doing things that other companies wouldn't, that, you know, the better actors in that space wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily do, but, uh, but still, even with, you know, the question that, that, that I've seen, it, you know, debated and some scientists have raised is, you know, even if we are, even if things are going as well as they possibly can, is this still a, a, a bridge fuel or is it just a, you know, a rickety pier out into nowhere, you know, because it's still a fossil fuel. And so, the, so what they say is when are we going to, when are we going to just stop this? Like, when, you know, when, when are we going to transition into, into something that's sustainable? Something sustainable and clean. Daniel, let me pass off to you. Uh, yeah, I was, I was wondering if, um, if you had seen the film um, Gasland before making this film. That's the only, that's my, before this film was my only familiarity with fracking. Uh, and did it affect 
how you made the film at all? We saw it eventually. Uh, we hadn't seen it when we started writing, um, but it, as part of all the re reading and, that we were doing we, and research, we, we watched it and, uh, and have heard interviews with Josh Fox and, uh, you know, and, and, and incorporated some of his arguments into, uh, into uh, John's character and some of the en energy industry's arguments into mine. Uh, because we wanted to, to, you know, to us it wasn't the, the the idea behind the movie wasn't to make a polemic. It was just to start a conversation and to show really the human side of this issue. Like this, this isn't a movie about a town where natural gas drilling is happening. This is a movie about a town that gets to pr approached with the possibility of it. So it's really just the first stage. Uh, you know. Th I think people people's perception is that this might be a movie about people getting sick and people you know and it's just this that's not that this movie this is a we were more interested in looking at um, kind of where we are as a country and how we make the decisions that we make and how are we all thinking collectively you know are we thinking about the long term or the short term where's our what, you know that idea of stewardship what would the generation before us have done if if given this same choice. Um, what are we going to do, uh, and and what kind of country are we going to be in the future? And that was really where we wanted to set it up. So it was a it was a jumping off point. We didn't want to we didn't want to cover the whole, you know, the the issue and then and, and and give an answer. You know, there's a vote at the end of our movie. We never say how the vote comes out because the point what we're really trying to make is a pro community, pro democracy movie where you know the town has to take responsibility for its decision at the end. Which, incidentally, is something that the energy industry doesn't want. That's a big sticking point for them because they don't want to argue these points or litigate this stuff town to town to town. In their perfect world, they would these decisions would be made at a state level um, because they say it's easier for them to know what their regulations are if they can just do one-stop shopping and understand what the rules are for the entire state, and then they can go get on with it. On the other side of that is people who actually live in these communities and say, I don't want a decision about what's going to happen in my backyard that could potentially affect me or my children to be made by somebody who lives on the other side of the state and maybe accepting money from this industry, you know, political contributions. Um, so I understand that point too. And you know, and and again, as we point out in the movie, these aren't these are the poorer communities. I mean, it would be unthinkable that in Bel Air or Beverly Hills or Pacific Palisades or the Hamptons that that anybody at the state level would tell them, you know, that they didn't have any control over whether or not there was going to be like <laughs> fracking you know in their backyard I mean that's that's ludicrous um, so I think the people in these you know these poor communities r these rural communities are saying well why don't we have a voice uh, why, why can't why shouldn't these decisions be made at the local level and again the, the on the other side of that is the energy industry going well, well it's just not cost effective for us to have to argue this from town to town to town like can't we just set some ground rules what makes your character in this movie interesting, Matt, is he's a corporate soldier, a real go-go guy. On the other hand, he's a little bit conflicted. And where I'm conflicted, I know where he ends up. In the beginning of the movie, is he more devil than decent guy or the other way around? No, I think he, like a lot of people, sees what, uh, believes in what he's doing or has a rationale, at least, for doing what he's doing. Um, you know, and he doesn't, John and I talked a lot about, you know, in the first act you have a guy you establish a guy in the first scene who is from a, a, a farming community uh, that was really kept alive by uh, some industry. And the industry, the factory closed and went away. And this guy watched his town die on the vine. Um, and so he feels like he's offering uh, a lifeline to these communities that are similar to his. And, and that's what he tells himself. And he believes that that, that industry is exactly what's going to save these, these communities. Um, and, and, you know, by the third act, you know, in the second act, he basically gets fracked, you know, emotionally by the, his experience with the town, his interactions with the townspeople, and, but he doesn't become an environmentalist at the end of the movie. I mean, we never felt like that would be a believable kind of story. What he does is he inserts himself into this process, this voting process, because he sees democracy getting hijacked. Right, and 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 that's and he can't abide that. So he steps in to just say, "Listen, whatever you decide, this is this has to be your decision, right? And you have to take responsibility for it." 
you have to start engaging with these with these decisions. So it's not just about fracking or natural gas. It's about any of these decisions we're making um, in a world where it feels like you know increasingly the political uh, you know our politicians have been co-opted or bought off, or there's you know the deck is increasingly stacked against the common man, and 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 so so stand up and take responsibility and engage as a citizen. Daniel? Uh, this is uh, your third time writing a screenplay with uh, one of your co-stars. Uh, you wrote, of course, Good Will Hunting with Ben Affleck and then Jerry with Casey Affleck, and now John Krasinski uh, wrote uh, Promised Land with you. Uh, none of you are primarily known as writers, so how is the creative process different from one film to the next? Well, I think because we're all actors, uh, the process was similar in, uh, in each uh, case, you know. It was just a lot of improvisation and just building scenes, having a loose idea of what the story was and what the structure was, and then just, um, you know, trying to, trying to write the scenes kind of together in a more active way. Like, we never would sit down and just uh, type, you know, that's not really our strength. It's, it's, it's building the scene uh, through improvising it and then writing down, you know, uh, you know, the things that we thought worked and then, and then kind of doing it, doing it that way. Um, so, so no, I mean, I know, you know, as I was an English major in college, I mean, I, I was never the guy who was good at staring at a blank computer screen. That always drove me crazy. Um, but, but I was taught, uh, in high school, uh, a lot, so, and so was Ben by a great, uh, drama teacher, an English teacher named Jerry Specka, who, who would write a play with the, with the students every year. We'd write one play and he would do it in this way where he would get, get it up, get kids up on their feet and improvising scenes and, and then he'd. You know, he'd call you know kind of the good stuff out of what you know out of that exploration and and uh, and start and start cobbling it into a scene. That's basically what we do. We have a question from the chat room here. We're live on the homepage of Gold Derby, and some people are putting in questions. A guy named Keith wants to know, what do you think of Ben Affleck's Argo? <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> that's a that's a big question. Uh, I, well, I'm obviously I love it. Um, you know, he showed it to me. In March, um, a, a, a cut, pretty close to the final cut. Um, in March, and and the lights came up, and I just went like that. That's a, it's, I, I didn't know what to say. I mean, it was just phenomenal, and uh, you know, I'm I'm really proud of him. I'm I'm not surprised at all. I, I you know, having known him for 32 years and written a movie with him, and you know, I, I bought the stock low. I you know. When we were on the Amtrak at you know fourteen and sixteen, going to audition for the Mickey Mouse Club um, down in New York, I was the guy telling him like, "I think you're great, man. You're really gonna make it." So, uh, so I, I, I'm happy to see that this has happened. I'm, I'm happy, particularly given where he was ten years ago, and and the uh, you know he really did some time in actor jail there, and uh, and I'm glad he's he's. He sprung himself, and uh, and and now he's at the top of the A list in literally every category. So that's that's great, and he deserves it. Daniel. Uh, yeah, you mentioned we're talking about Ben Affleck and his how his career has surged of late. Uh, you know, that's his third film as a director. This was actually supposed to be your first film as a director, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I we wrote it with that in mind. Yeah, definitely. And then I had to bow out because. I just I was doing the Neil Blomkamp movie and it went longer than I thought it would and uh, and so it was just one of those situations where I'd been away from my kids longer than I thought I was going to be and suddenly uh, I was going to have to turn around and go into pre-production in two weeks and be away from them for 20 weeks and it just was untenable on the personal side for me so I just uh, you know walked away from it which was tough because we'd we'd worked really hard on the screenplay getting it to a place where we were ready to go and it was the exact size and scope of you know something that I wanted to do, and 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 it was the movie that I wanted to do, but um, but it just wasn't meant to be. Because we're an awards website, I have to ask the obligatory awards question here, uh, Matt, and that is, you are somebody who, in in a large way, has been made by awards because uh, you came to prominence, you and Ben, in such a spectacular way uh, on the Oscar red carpet, and the whole thing was so adorable, seeing you guys absolutely overwhelmed by this whole process, by this whole world watching. And, and I think we all were enjoying the experience with you because of the youth, the vitality, the excitement of it all. But it was in an awards context. I mean, take us back to that, uh, to that period of your life. What were you thinking looking out at all of this? It was just 
utterly surreal. Um, I can't, it, I still, 15 years later, have trouble describing what it was like because <clears throat> we went from, from watching the Oscars, you know, with the sheet of paper with all the nominees on, you know, where you, where you put in a couple bucks and everybody in the room is betting on who, who's going to win the most categories. From literally doing what a lot of people do and sitting around drinking beer and watching the Oscars to in one year um, being in the front row and having Billy Crystal sing a song about us and I mean there was just no there was no which the transition year where we got to go and just sit in the back and, and just kind of watch the whole spectacle it just happened right away and and uh, it was it and it was dovetailing with our lives changing and suddenly walking down the street and people stopping and turning and looking at us or walking into a room and the conversation stopping and every head turning and looking at you that which just isn't normal and isn't natural and so all of, so it was we were trying to process all this stuff at the same time that this incredibly surreal spectacle was going on around us and uh, it's just it was amazing it was it was you know terrifying and fun and and anxiety you know riddled and and uh, um, you know I, I mean it just I'm still it's it's taken 15 years I think to work through it Daniel, I'm going to leave the last question to you. What will it be? Um, well, you know, awards season is is such an arduous process. It can be for for some actors and and filmmakers promoting their projects. And and you've you've had that process several times throughout your career in the last uh, decade or so. Has it changed? Do you think since Goodwill Hunting, the the campaigning process? Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's ridiculous. It's really I, I I this was a this has been a shock to me looking at. You know, Goodwill Hunting, and we had Harvey Weinstein, you know, with us for Goodwill Hunting, and and he he's the guy who really sees the Matrix when it comes to this stuff. And I I think we did a cocktail party. I think that was it. Um, there were no screenings. There were no uh, Q and As that I remember. Um, there were no. It's just turned in. It's morphed into this thing, and. Uh, you know, I, I, it's been really shocking to me uh, to to see what's happened. Um, you know, and not all good. I mean, it's, it seems like a like our, we could do better with our resources. There's a lot of other things going on in the world that we could, you know, you could still have the awards. I mean, and I don't know that. I mean, I can't imagine like what's going to change. Like I, I, I mean, I think most people are like me. They see movies and they know which ones they like, and if they have a vote, they know which one they're going to vote for. And you know. It, you're just you're just having a party so everyone can get a free sandwich. I mean, I don't see you know, but it's like everybody does it, and so now now it's like everybody does it, and then it's like you have to go or, or you you know or you're being rude to the you know and and which is just I don't know. I mean, it's just it's morphed into something that's completely different. Like it's it's utterly different than it was 15 years ago, and I was at the heart of it 15 years ago. I asked Harvey once, Matt, how much money did you make when Chicago won Best Picture? How much money did you make as a result of it winning Best Picture? Right. And he put a price tag on it. He said $100 million. Now dial back the Oscars two years ago to the King's speech. That made $400 million worldwide. How much do you think that would have made if it had not been an awards contender at all? I mean, it kind of looked like a BBC Masterpiece Theater production, right? And a good one. But the awards process is what took that to these spectacular heights financially. Which is why this is happening. I mean, nobody's doing it because they, you know, I mean, <laughs> they're doing it for money. It's all, it's all for money. There's a, there's a, uh, you know, I mean, as you say, I mean, de depending on the project, I should say, I mean, I don't think the Hurt Locker did particularly right. Bafo box mm -hmm. office, but I think it's tough to get people to go to see a movie about Iraq anyway at that time. But, um, I mean, see Green Zone. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But um, but you know, it, it, there is a there's obviously a you know a big upside if you can get you know attention uh, or get some nominations like that just puts the patina of class on your project and you know for a movie like King Speech is a great example because that's not a huge budget um, you know and and but if you if you open the newspaper and you see it's got these awards and you go well this is a you know, this is a good use of my time, and I think a lot of people who are busy and kind of, you know, have their lives that they're getting on with, you know, they they 
and they want to see a movie, they, they maybe see three or four movies a year, they're going to look at the ones that seem to have the, you know, the, the great reviews and, and uh, seem to be worth the, you know, their, their time and money. So, so no, I mean, I understand why it all happens. It's just, it's just become much, much more uh, granular. You know? It feels more like a presidential campaign, like when you talk to these political consultants and they talk about you know, the, when they really get down into like the minutia of, of, of the process and that's what it's kind of become. Like you go to these, these Q and A's and every, every single person there feels like they're in that one county of Ohio and they're going to determine, <laughs> you know, and they know it and they're looking at you like, yeah, you guys just come talk to me, buddy. You know, like, <laughs> I live in such and such a county basically. And, uh, and I know you want to be president. So, so, you know, come sit with me for a little while. Well, get, let me have the last word here. I love to make this observation that our proof that Hollywood is a crazy town is that it spends, Matt, $100 million a year to win a statuette, a, a fake gold statuette that costs $400 to manufacture. <laughs> <laughs> on, on that note, thank you very much. <laughs> and well, good luck to you, I promise. But as you say, you know, if you're the king's speech, you know, it, that, it, it's, it's worth it for you, you know? I mean, I just don't like... The one thing I don't like, I mean, I think an actors have groused about this for, you know, since the time immemorial is, 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 the, is the idea that there are winners and losers, you know? I mean, I went to, a, <clears throat> I went to an event, the, the Gotham Awards in New York, and uh, they, had, they had nominees for different categories, and they had that beautiful little girl from Beasts of the Southern Wild, you know, who's phenomenal in that movie, and... She was surrounded by adults and who were really, you know, wanting to win, you know, and really into it. And, you know, what does she know, right? She's seven, eight. And, uh, and they announced the winner and it was the, uh, someone else in her category. And it was a surprise to everyone that this great little girl didn't win. And you saw this, like, collective gasp go up at her table. And, like, what are we saying to an eight-year-old kid who does something so wonderful and then is made to somehow feel like a loser. Like, that's, that's insane. And, and it, I don't know what to do about that or whether to just somehow celebrate the nominations more, you know, because it's a big deal. Like, the Oscar itself is a total crapshoot. It's just, it's literally a popularity contest versus the, you know, the nominations. It's like you should just do five awards in each category for, for excellence this year and, and, and just say, okay, these five people, you know, the industry wants to just single them out and, go, and give you like an attaboy this year and go, great job. You know, we see what you're doing, great work, and, and celebrate them somehow. But it turns into a contest, which, is, which makes four people who did phenomenal work somehow feel like losers at the end of it, which is, which is nuts. Yeah, it's it's certainly nuts. We all agree with you there, but we all cannot take our eyes away from watching it, right? I guess not. <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> so I'll see you at a cocktail party, Tom. Okay, same here. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Appreciate right. it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.